Let's start, Mr. Hitchcock, by discussing this uh, whole business of frightening audiences. Do you find that audiences are, 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 are frightened by different things now from the things that frightened them when you started, what, 30 years ago, 35 years ago, making films? No, I wouldn't say so, because after all, they were frightened as children. You have to remember that it's all based on Red Riding Hood, you see. Nothing has changed since Red Riding Hood. So what they're frightened of today are exactly the same things they were frightened of yesterday. Yeah. Because this, shall we call it, this fright complex is rooted in every individual. Do you think when making films that uh, women are frightened by different things from the things that frighten men? Um, oh, I, I would say so, yes. I would, I would definitely say that, uh, after all, women are frightened by a mouse. Men are. You don't see men jumping on chairs and screaming. So there are definitely different things. So when you make a film, are you setting out to frighten men or women? Or women, because 80% of the audience in the cinema are women. Um, because, you see, even if the house is 50-50, half men, half women, a good percentage of the men has, of the, uh, has said to his girl, being on the make, of course, what do you want to see, dear? So that's where her influence comes as well. So uh, men have very little to do with the choice of the film. When it comes to um, audiences in different parts of the world, take, uh, take American audiences as against British audiences, instead of men and women for a moment, mm -hmm. um, Bearing in mind the, your Red Riding Hood point that we're all frightened by the great simple things, are American audiences frightened by different things from European audiences? Uh, I would say no. You see, you've got to remember the American audience is the global audience. As I once reminded an Englishman, I said, you don't understand America because you think they are, they are Americans, but they're not. America is full of foreigners. They're all foreigners since 1776. So therefore, whatever frightens the Americans frightens the Italians, the Romanians, the Danes, and everyone else, you know, from Europe. Do you think that it does an injustice to you uh, simply to think of you as a man who, above all else, has frightened the, uh, the wits out of audiences? Yes, but you have to remember that this process of frightening is done by means uh, of a given medium. The medium of pure cinema mm. is what I believe in. Um, the, the assembly of pieces of film to create fright is the essential part of my job. Just as much as a painter would, uh, by putting certain colors together, create evil on canvas. Now, you would go as far as that, would you, to say that to create fright is an essential or the essential part of my job? Of my job? Yes. Um, only in terms of the audience expected from me. Let me put it in another way. Uh, you're a master, aren't you, of the unexpected? Uh, uh, well, that's, that's, that's only because one's challenged by the audience. They're saying to me, show us and I know what's coming next, and I say, do you? And therefore, that's the avoidance of the cliché, automatically. They're expecting the cliché, and I have to say, um, we cannot have a cliché here. When you, uh, when you talk about putting bits of film together, um, and then creating, in, in terms of what you call pure cinema, the sequence that you're going for, mm -hmm. um, I can imagine that it must have been a bit of a shock to you personally when talkies came. Because, in a sense, you're talking almost about, uh, about a classical technique, aren't you? Well, the only thing wrong with the silent picture was that mouths opened and no sound came out. Unfortunately, when talk came in, the vulgarians, the money changers of the industry, immediately uh, commenced to cash in by photographing stage plays. So that took the whole thing away from cinema completely. 
It's like a lot of films one sees today. Not that I see very many, but to me they're what I call photographs of people talking. and bears no relation to the art of the cinema. And the point is that the power of cinema in its purest form is so vast because it can go over the whole world. On a given night, a film can play in Tokyo, West Berlin, London, New York, and the same audience is responding emotionally to the same things. And no other medium can do this. The theatre uh, doesn't do it because you've got different sets of people. But remember, in a film, they're the same actors. A book is translated. How well do we know? I don't know. The risk is in translating even a film, what they call dubbing, you know. Yeah. There's, there's liable to be a loss, and therefore, when one's thinking of a film globally, the talk is reduced to a minimum, and if possible, tell the story visually, and let the talk be part of the atmosphere. Is it true that uh, you are yourself... Um I've seen it in newspaper cuttings and this kind of thing, that you are yourself a great expert on crime. Well, uh, do you mean in committing no, I wasn't it? suggesting, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> uh, as a detective, you mean, on that side? No. No, no, I, I'm interested uh, in, uh, and I suppose one has at one fingertips all the details of the famous cases of the past, and I've often used examples, pieces of them, in films, for example, in the film Rear Window. Yes, I remember well. Uh, there are two passages in it which come from famous English crime. Crippling case, I used a bit of that. And the Patrick Mann case, you know, Mann was a man who um, killed a girl and then cut her up into pieces and threw the flesh out of the window <laughs> in a, from a train between Eastbourne and London. But his great problem was what to do with the head. And that's what I put in, uh, in the rear window with a dog sniffing the flower bed. And uh, I remember I'm, I was making a movie years ago and I employed as, as a technical advisor um, uh, a man who was uh, one of the big four at Scotland Yard, and he was on this case. And uh, this man, Marn, didn't know what to do with the head, so he put it into the fire grate and put a fire under it. And there was a big storm going on outside. It was the crumbles at Eastbourne on the beach. And uh, the heat, while this thunder and lightning was going on, it was awfully terribly melodramatic. The heat under the head caused the eyes to open. So this poor man ran out into the storm and, and never came and came back in the morning when, when the fire had done its job. And this particular superintendent, ex-superintendent, rather, Scotland Yard, told me that he went to the butchers and got a sheep's head and put it in the grate to test the time it would take to burn. So the head business went into this picture. What frightens you personally, Mr Hitchcock, if anything? Any trouble frightens me. I was once asked, what is your idea of happiness? And I said, a clear horizon. These steps were terribly awkward coming down. One had to step them one by one and reminded me of the old lady who was walking with one foot on the curb and one foot in the road. And they said to her, why are you walking like that? She said, oh, I thought I was lame. <laughs> this is obviously going to be my absolute downfall, this interview. So I approach you really as the depressed area's David Frost, uh, Mr. Hitchcock. I don't want to ask you any of the questions I'm sure have bored you over the years. Well, I'd try and avoid them anyway. What interests me, to start the ball rolling, I'm fascinated by writers' diaries, by writers' notebooks, and therefore, as a fellow director, I'm fascinated at the point where you feel yourself committed. Is it in the script? Is it the first day? Is it long before the script? Where do you think it all starts for you? Well, uh, for me, it all starts with the uh, basic material first. Now, the question 
when you have, we'll say, basic material, you may have a novel, you may have a play, you can have an original idea, you can have just a couple of sentences, and from that the film begins. Now I work very closely with the writer and begin to construct the film on paper. From the very beginning we say, well, when we roughly sketch in the whole shape of the film and then begin from the beginning. And you end up with, say, a hundred pages or maybe even more of narrative, which is very bad reading for a literateur. And I mean, there are no descriptions of any kind. No, for example, he wondered, because you can't photograph, he wondered. And no camera pans right or anything. Not at that garbage, stage. No. Not at that no. stage, no. It is as though you were looking at the film on the screen and the sound was turned off. And therefore, to me, this is the first uh, stage. Now, the reason for it is this. It is to urge one, to drive one, to make one work purely in the visual, and not rely upon words at all because I'm still a purist, and I do believe that film, being the newest art of the 20th century, is a series of images projected on a screen, and this succession of images create ideas, which in their turn create emotion, just as much as in literature, words put together create sentences and so on and so forth. Do you think at that stage, do you think in black and white or is your preference for color? I mean, do you find yourself thinking in terms of black and white images? Not at all, no. The color, the color is part of the structure. In other words, uh, you restrain color, bring it in when it's necessary, but don't orchestrate it so loudly that later on you may use it in, in a word to mix metaphors a moment. You've exploded your gunpowder. Yes, I, I mean, there was, a, there was something behind that question because, if I may be so bold, I thought there was only one of your films which leaps to mind which I thought would have been better in black and white, and that was The Birds. I don't know why. This is only a personal preference. I would have preferred to have seen that film in black and white. I wondered why you opted for colour. Uh, well, I, strange enough you should ask that. I opted for colour because the birds were black and white. <laughs> yes. So that the faces of the people involved would be separated from the birds. My, my question was really more technical, because I felt the, the, the technique of the birds, the phony birds, would have perhaps been less obvious to me and, uh, if they'd have been in black and white. That was the only thing that I... Well, uh, we actually used real birds. There were no mechanical birds used at all. Well, there were one or two uh, wooden ones or stationary ones, weren't there? Uh, we hoped that it deceived the eye. <laughs> But uh, that was purely a matter of quantity rather than quality. <laughs> when, when you say you, you start with a script, how many, uh, I mean, I know in my own case, the amount of, uh, as it were, stillborn children one has, how many times do you think in your career 
have you started off with what hopefully you thought was something that was going to excite you and alas have had to abandon it? Oh, many times. Mm. In the last two years I've abandoned two projects. And uh, the point is you get so far and you realize it's not going to work out. So it's better to lose 150000 or $200,000 than two million. Yes. So just dump it and let it go. I've often found myself, and perhaps you have had the same experience, that although we dump things, certain things, part of the egg remains and continues to gestate, and we pull them out of a drawer, out of our subconscious in years later, and use them again in a different context. Does that happen to you? No, it doesn't happen to me. The only thing that I pigeonhole are certain ideas that be belong to a certain genre picture. The adventure film, for example, you store up an idea and uh, you put it away and one day it will come out. For example, in a picture like North by Northwest, I've waited about 15 years to put Mount Rushmore on the yes. screen. Yes. So you keep it back in your mind. Unfortunately, it doesn't always work out because storing this thing up and having the pleasure of anticipating the use of it, the Department of Interior step in hmm. and say, you mustn't have any character uh, climbing over the faces of the presidents. And you say, why not? They say, oh, because this is the shrine of democracy. <laughs> you must only have your characters sliding or chasing between the heads. <laughs> and I was completely defeated because I had a lovely idea, which I thought, of the uh, Cary Grant sliding down Lincoln's nose <laughs> and then hiding in the nostril. <laughs> it's and, a Kleenex ad. And uh, the man in search of him is in the vicinity, but unfortunately Cary Grant hiding in the nostril, begins to have a sneezing fit. <laughs> and uh, I was never allowed to do it. Well, shall we invite some questions from the audience yes, on what we've discussed that. so far? Um, that one. I wondered, uh, had you ever been tempted to step outside the sort of thriller limitation and do something completely different? Or is it the attraction, not, you know, is the limitation the attraction to do something new? Well, no, it's not for me. It's, a, it's, the, uh, it's the public, you see. If I made, for example, a musical, uh, the public would wonder, when will the moment come when one of the, <laughs> when one of the uh, chorus girls will drop dead? <laughs> and what from? <laughs> Gentleman at the back, next, nearly next to the lady in green. Yes, you, sir. Uh, apart from self-satisfaction, Mr. Hitchcock, what is your basic motive for making the films that you do make? Basic motive? Money. <laughs> There's an old expression which says, all work and no play makes jack. <laughs> Mr. Hitchcock, you said that uh, you have in your uh, mental back drawer, mental bottom drawer, if you like, a series of bizarre or locations or backdrops. Which one would you most like to use in your films and haven't had yet the opportunity to do so? Well, I once had an idea that I would like to open a film, say, at the Covent Garden Opera or the Metropolitan or the Scala in Milan. And Maria Callas is on the stage singing an aria and her head is tilted upwards and she sees in a box way up a man approach the back of another man and stab him. She is just reaching a high note. <laughs> and the high note turns to a scream and it's the highest note she's ever sung in her life. <laughs> the result of which she gets a huge round of applause. <laughs> uh, 
I don't know the rest. <laughs> Make that one for me. I'll buy that. Um, just up here. Uh, yes. Uh, Ma no, the lady, please. Oh, sorry. Mr. Hitchcock, I wanted to know, as I was scared stiff by Psycho, what frightens you? Policemen frighten me. <laughs> Uh, no, the, uh, the, uh... Not English policemen, surely. Oh, the worst. <laughs> because they're so polite. <laughs> Mr. Hitchcock, you seem to have a very nice sense of humour, which you obviously had before you established yourself as a thriller, um, directing thrillers. How come you've never had any comedies? But... But every film I make is a comedy. Uh, Mr. Hitchcock, um, could you tell us when you first had the idea of appearing in all your films? Um, I think it started with The Lodger. And could you tell us why? Because I don't know of any other filmmaker that does it. No, in those early days we ran out of actors. <laughs> That's really 